Good afternoon, everyone. We are back for our third week of our 12 week summer series. Um, what happened to you? Featuring a book written by um, Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry. And we're here every week because of the vision that uh, TDR Brands CEO, April, um, uh, uh, TDR Brands with Tierra Destiny Reed. Um, Tierra is our visionary of When Women Heal. And When Women Heal is a community where women are able to heal, grow, and become empowered. I got so excited tonight, guys. So excited because of our phenomenal guests that we have tonight. And just kind of sharing a few things behind the scene is just going to be so exciting. First of all, we are welcoming tonight Keisha Robinson, and I am your media, your host, Dr. Glenise Harris Wilson with Living Connected. Keisha is uh, simply amazing. We're so excited to have you, Keisha, and welcome. Keisha is here as a lifestyle mentor, blogger, speaker, and an emergent author. So let's welcome Keisha. Um, Keisha, we want you to just feel relaxed and comfortable and get ready to share some powerful things for our women, for our community, and just for ladies at large, because you and I both know that many, 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 many women have various struggles. We know that many women are hurting. Many women are trying to find their place as to where they where they are. So um, I'm going to just allow us to really, really dive into what you're ready to bring to our community tonight. So let me ask you, Keisha, you know we have been working with the book, What Happened to You? Yes, ma'am. What did you think about this book when you first picked it up and kind of start reading and start really reflecting? What did you think about it? Okay, well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Glenise, for um, being the wonderful person that you are um, mm -hmm. and having me on tonight. Thank you so much to Tierra Destiny Reed and to the Win Women Heal community. I am honored to be here tonight with you guys um, and just to share um, about the wonderful book <laughs> um, that, we're, <laughs> that we're reading. Um, and Dr. Glenise, you asked me what, was my, what were my thoughts when I first picked it up. And I will tell you, um, when I first started to um, open the cover and start reading um, just the first chapter, I was taken aback. I had to take a deep breath because um, I'm, an, I'm an avid reader. I enjoy reading. Um, I'm usually that person who picks up one book. I'm, I'm reading through it fairly quickly and then I'm on to the next. But this particular book stopped me in my tracks because um, there's so much in there. There's so much um, connection and so much of um, things that I've, I've experienced or I know of other people who've experienced. It was really a personal um, read for me as I started to kind of connect the dots of some of my own life to some of what um, Ms. Oprah, Oprah and um, Dr. Perry were sharing. Okay, so what part specifically can you say um, that kind of connected to your own life? Uh, well, um, one of the four first things that connected for me was the um, the conversation around um, what happens to you as a young child um, and how it's imprinted in your psyche and how you take it forward into your life. Um, I'm an educator. I've been an educator for over 20 years uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of children um, and it really resonated for me and kind of reinforced some of the things that I already know is that how children are impacted by their environments. And um, I could remember certain students in particular, um, some of the challenges that, that they were facing and how um, it tied back to the book and some of the, the dialogue that was happening um, in the book. But um, one of the things that stood out to me and connected with me 
um, more specifically was the conversation around your lower self. Um, when your emotions are high, you're not able to think as clearly. Um, and the disassociation piece, because um, that was something that I really, um, really did was I, I would disconnect from things that were happening with me. And um, because I was so emotional about certain things that were happening, I wasn't able to make as as good a decisions as I would have liked to have made. What do you feel you disassociated yourself from? Mm. Well, um, I would say that my particular traumatic experience <laughs> was uh, being divorced. Um, mm -hmm. I was uh, married early and I was divor divorced early as well. Um, and so there was a lot of shame associated with that. There was mm -hmm. a lot of blame that was associated with that. And I also had some guilt that was associated with that. And so, um, for me, disassociating was withdrawing, um, kind of going into my own space, creating my own environment to, to um, protect myself um, from some of the conversations that were happening around um, my divorce and um, things of that nature. Um, I live in a small town and everybody knows everybody. And I'm the hometown girl. I married a young man. Uh, we uh, moved back to where I'm from. And so we started a life here. So everybody knew us, everybody knew my family. We were singers in the community, well-established in the church. Um, and so um, it, was, it was quite traumatic when I divorced um, my ex-husband. Um, there were some different things that were going on that were that I decided I was not able to stay in the marriage anymore. So I divorced. Um, I was embarrassed by the fact that divorce hadn't happened in my family before. I was the first person in my mind that I know of to bring marriage into our family. So I was embarrassed by that. Um, it was public. We, like I said, we were in church. We were active in church. Um, I, you know, sang in the choir, um, was uh, just involved in, in ministry and in church. And so to um, hear the side conversations or have different things go on and being concerned about how um, I brought this into my family because to actually my parents' anniversary is today. They're 51 years married oh, wow. today. Wow, tell them yes, happy anniversary. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And so I come from a long line of people who have stayed together and made it work and got through the hard times and, and all of that. And so for me um, to, to go through a divorce and it be public and open and everybody's talking about it, it was pretty traumatic. It was pretty traumatic. So um, one of the things that I did to um, kind of alleviate that was to disassociate and to withdraw, to withdraw from people, to um, retreat inside. Um, um, I was very nervous about other people, um, leery of folks, um, not sure if they meant me well, uh, if they, um, you know, what they were saying about me behind my back, I was really concerned about that. I was really concerned about image, extremely concerned about image. Um, because, it, it, you know, just in growing up in church, you know, you follow the rules, you do what you're supposed to do, you keep your head down, you work, you create a good life and, and you keep it moving. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was pretty traumatic for me. So, um, yeah, I, I disassociated quite a bit to get through that period. So let me ask you a question because I, I work with a lot of women um, in the counseling practice and I work with a lot of women who are divorced. I work with people that have gone through very difficult marriages or are presently in very difficult marriages. When you said, you said several words that you kind of start to identify yourself with and that was the shame, the blame, the guilt, um, these things which means that as you went through the healing of the divorce, you had to redefine yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you were defining yourself by the shame and the blame and the guilt? 
Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. I wore that. I wore the shame of it. I, you know, um, regardless of what happened with us, um, there was um, just some th things that happened. You know, marriage is difficult for anybody, right? Um, you're going to have challenges and things of that nature. But then there was um, some infidelity. There was, um, you know, just other things that would come up. And I was trying to, um, to make it work. I was gonna make it work against all odds. I was committed. But what I found out was that one person being committed to the relationship is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, the other person's person also has to be just as committed. And um, if they're not, and if you know they're showing you that they're not, then you've got to make some decisions and make some adjustments. And so I wore the shame of making that decision and making that adjustment. Um, as I said, you know, divorce was not something that happened in my family. I hadn't seen that. Mm -hmm. And so to experience that, I felt the shame of being a divorced single mom, um, being viewed a certain way in my community and in my environment. And um, I felt a lot of the weight of shame behind that. You know, oftentimes we hear people saying, everybody, every woman has a little girl in them. There's a little girl in all of us. Um, having gone through that, um, what was the little girl like in you during that time? The little girl in me was scared. She felt as though um, she was in over her head. She didn't really know um, what to do with this new dynamic of, of being a single mom and trying to take care of everything. And um, uh, I was prideful. I didn't want to ask for help. I didn't want to let on that I needed anything because um, the other piece to that is that I was determined I was going to make this work, whatever the this is, I was going to make it work. And so um, I had a persona, I had an exterior, um, you know, that everything was all right. And uh, I was fine. I was fine when really I wasn't. I was that scared little girl inside trying to figure out how I was going to make it and get through this particular situation. What do you feel, uh, Keisha? Um, you had to, we talked a little bit earlier about you redefining yourself. What did it take for you to redefine who Keisha was in terms of being different from that scared little girl or that woman that was walking in shame, trying to hold her head up, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how did you redefine, what did you do to redefine yourself? Um, first of all, I reconnected with God. <laughs> um, I had to reevaluate my relationship with God put him first and foremost. So there was a rededication period, um, apologizing and repenting for, um, you know, making decisions without him. Um, because the truth of the matter is, um, I knew when I was getting married that I shouldn't be doing it, but I did it anyway. Um, don't know if anybody's ever done that before, done something that they know they shouldn't have done, but they did it anyway. I think, um, I think no, <laughs> I think I think the number is great. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I, I did that. I did that. And so um, I had to, to rededicate and recommit. And I, I did some seeking. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a reader. And um, I started picking up different books and um, trying to get my hands on anything that was self-help related. And so I was trying to self-help, you know, take care of myself. <laughs> Excuse me. And so that it started with that. It started with, um, uh, you know, getting back into um, my Bible and spending that time trying to figure out what I believed and what was somebody else's belief. So I really had to do some evaluation to figure out just what I believe, uh, you know, about my walk and about God and about life in general and what 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 it was that I believed that was separate from what somebody else believed. And so that's been an ongoing process of unlearning things that were not mine per se, but were uh, mine as a result of my environment. 
And you know, we all, when we go through things, we, we want somebody there. We want as difficult as it is to trust, you still want somebody that you from time to time can pick up the phone to talk to. Can you meet me for lunch? Can you meet me for dinner? Whatever the case may be, right? Um, and we know God was there with you. you. We know you were walking the journey, as you just said. But when it comes to people, who can you say was the most influential going through this uh, just t horrible time that you was facing? Well, um, my mom was helpful um, during that time. My mom is, is very wise. She's a very wise woman. Um, and she would encourage me um, to tap in, to push in um, to God and to gain strength there. She would also um, give me practical advice. Um, there was a particular, <clears throat> there was a particular thought leader that she mentioned that I should um, seek out, that I should follow. And so I did that. Um, I, I listened to um, my mom, I, my self-esteem was in a low place. I um, didn't trust my decision-making. Um, so I, I, I really relied on my mom for um, guidance and for support. What do you feel was one thing, if you can recall, and maybe you can, maybe you can't, but can you recall uh, one piece of advice that your mom gave? <laughs> She said, girl. <laughs> now, when you hear the word girl, that's when it gets serious. Like, listen, let me tell you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. She said, girl, let me tell you one thing. You are not the first person to go through a divorce and you are not going to be the last. So you need to pull yourself together and get it together for this baby that you're raising. Keisha, did you ever feel though, it, although you were trying to have that strong woman mentality, right? But did you ever feel that you weren't going to make it? I, ooh, Dr. Glenise, listen. <laughs> <laughs> there were countless times, days, um, when I felt like I wasn't going to make it. I, I can remember um, feeling so much overwhelmed um, just with the overhead, with, with bills, with um, you know, taking care of my car, um, how I was going to take care of, of groceries. Um, I remember even um, at one point I was fishing change out of my, out of the ashtray in my car, um, trying to make a decision as to whether or not I was going to put gas in my car or if I was going to get milk for my little girl. Mm -hmm. So I, there was lots of days where I felt like I wasn't going to make it. I, I, there was lots of days when I felt like I wasn't gonna make it, I wasn't gonna get through it, um, I, I wasn't gonna get it together. Um, I doubted myself so much. Um, lots of negative mind chatter. My self-esteem was so low, so mm -hmm. beat down. Mm -hmm. I lost a, a large amount of weight. And I, at that time, I may have weighed 125, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I lost a lot of weight. Um, I lost my hair, began to come out in patches. Um, I was new in my career of teaching and um, was diagnosed with stress-induced hypertension. And I was in denial about that for a long time. I did not medicate because I didn't feel bad. You know, I, I didn't feel bad. I, I, I remember um, being at work one day and I got a horrible headache and I pushed through it because, you know, that's what you do. And I thought that it was sinuses when it really wasn't. <laughs> it was, my blood pressure was up. Mm -hmm. And um, and so then I started seeing spots in, in front of my eyes. And I remember, you know, just the, it going dark and not being able to see. Mm -hmm. And um, so now I'm like, okay, I, I really have to do something um, because I, I'm all my baby has. I'm, I'm all she's got. So I got to be around to make sure that I take care of her. And so um, at that point, I started to, you know, take my blood pressure medication. And 
I, I, and to, to try to come out of that, I started to try and put her first. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if I couldn't do it for me, I was trying to make sure that I did what I needed to do to take care of me for her. Mm -hmm. So yes, ma'am, there were lots of days when I felt like I wasn't gonna make it. You know, um, Keisha, I too have been through the divorce um, episode of life that it can be so detrimental that you lose sight of who you are. You lose your identity. Yes, ma'am. Am I? Um, did you ever at some point question who Keisha was? Oh my gosh. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. I did. Um, as I said, I was just weighted down with so much shame, with guilt. I felt like I, you know, I bro broke up my my family. Um, my daughter was out without her father because of me. I mean, just so much is the bombardment of negative self-talk and not knowing who I was and trying to figure out, okay, um, as you know, I had so many hopes and dreams and thought that I'd be a certain place by a certain time because I was that person planning and, and all of that to be at a certain place by a certain time. And then I have this particular thing that happens in my life and now I'm off of that path and I'm doing something else. I've got the detour and now I've got to try to figure it out. So I, I did lose sight of who I was. I was trying to figure out, okay, so who is the person that gets themselves in this situation? I mean, what, what are you doing? Who, who are you? You know, um, very, very much so um, just beat down in, in my, you know, um, my self-esteem and not my self-confidence was gone. Um, just really feeling like I wasn't a good judge of character. I mean, just the gamut of emotions with that. And it's interesting because what a lot of people don't realize is that, and I see it every day, um, how what we go through, depending upon how we handle that, um, it affects uh, your self-esteem. Then mm -hmm. you start not having confidence and then you start to worry and mm -hmm. then that's when the anxiety starts to come right and, uh you start having headaches you start getting nauseous you start having stomach aches you start having shortness of breath you're wondering why am i breaking out in sweats and, and just a multiplicity of things why um have i lost my appetite why is mm -hmm. it not thinking my my thoughts are distorted uh, just a number of things mm -hmm. and they start to wonder, oh, I need to do, I need to go to the doctor. Then they go to the doctor and then sometimes they are not adequately diagnosed. They're diagnosed with the physical, right? right. Not right. diagnosed saying that you've got adjustment disorder or you got anxiety disorder and all of the others, you got depressive disorders. You got mm -hmm. all of the disorders that come mm -hmm. from life being out of order, right? right. And so- right you know, trying to come back full circle into who you are and what you truly want to be. A lot mm -hmm. of times just seeing that person uh, that you want to change into, mm -hmm. that can have just a bigger impact uh, to spiral you into depression as the situation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I noticed in your bio, Keisha, you, you've got such a phenomenal heart for women. I noticed you, you mentioned that women are more alike than they are different. What do you mean Absolutely. by that? Absolutely. What I mean by that is that we sometimes, most oftentimes, we try to hide and like I did, you know, put the best on the outside. Um, it's me against the world. I line my lips, I, you know, curl my hair, I, you know, <laughs> lights, camera action. I am stage ready. I like right? that. Light camera action. <laughs> right. Stage ready. But mm -hmm. behind the scenes, we have some of the same things. Uh, your situation may look completely different from mine, but there's a common thread in there that we all we all experience and and that some of that is self, low self-esteem it's feeling overwhelmed it's you know feeling like we're alone when really really we're not and in some of the the situations and, and women's women who have crossed my path that it, the common thread is 
we, we all have those same issues. We all have self-doubt. We all have, you know, confidence type things. We have self-esteem issues. We're trying to raise children as a single mom. You know, we're working two or three jobs. We're trying to navigate life with this exterior that we have everything together when really, really we can learn so much from each other if we could just take down the mask, you know, take down the wall and have that conversation across the aisles to try to, you know, bridge that gap to help each other out. Um, Keisha, let's, let me interject right there because you said some important things when it comes to, you know, women with the low self-esteem, women with the lack of confidence and all of the inner struggles that mm -hmm. women have. How do you correlate that? And you said it last, you, you said, be there for each other, but we don't always see that. Right. Why do you feel that's the part as women we struggle with? Um, I believe we struggle with that because of the divisiveness to keep us apart. There's like this underlying um, thing that keeps us apart. It's a competition um, that tries to keep us apart and we don't have to compete with each other. You know, we are each other's allies if we will allow ourselves to be vulnerable enough um, and take down those walls and say, you know what, girl, I'm going through the same thing. You know, I'm having the same challenge. Um, I can remember hearing, you know, people that I've talked to after you know, I started doing my work in, and since I've come, you know, got to this other side, not arrived, but I'm, I'm, you know, better along my journey where people would say, you know, you look like you had everything together and I just didn't want to approach you. I didn't know how to approach you. I didn't, you know, um, I didn't want to uh, feel like, um, I, I, I didn't, I felt like I could not approach you. Um, and, and we have that comparison thing, right? We, we separate ourselves and segregate ourselves because sometimes we just, I don't like you, but mm -hmm. for what? Why don't you like me? Why, why am I not approachable? Why, why is it so hard for us to just say, you know, girl, you, you, you know, your lipstick is cute. Mm -hmm. I love what you did mm -hmm. with your hair, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there's this competition thing that we as women have um, you know, as, as if something's going to be lost or taken away from, or, you know, something's, it's just that competition thing that that shouldn't be. And we should be more approachable and be able to, to bridge that gap to help each other out. Mm -hmm. And so I love being able to bring women together, especially in small settings to talk about those things that are common to us. Um, and try to, you know, level that playing field so that we there can be some conversation and there can be some camaraderie to mm -hmm. build those relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and this is just part of the counseling background where I believe in giving something a name. Uh, go ahead and name it. What is that thing? What, what is the thing that make you feel less than? What is that mm -hmm. thing that make you feel you're not good enough? What is that thing that make you feel um, less attractive? Uh, you know, and we can go on and on and on. The other mm -hmm. big thing, you said one, the competition. The other big C I think we run from is criticism. I think a yes. lot of times we can't step up in the step up to the plate because we fear being criticized. And right. I think way too often we get more criticisms than we do compliments. Right. Compliments build us up and criticism tear us down. And I think right. far too often a lot of women don't um step up and step out because they fear being criticized. Right. What do you right. feel could help break the cycle, the competitive cycle, the, the cycle of criticism? What do you feel could break this cycle? Because let's face it and let's just be honest, it's not anything new. Um, right. We didn't just start yesterday. So we mm -hmm. know it's, it's a cycle. Um, what is it that you feel we can do to start helping 
that these things don't become dominant among mm -hmm. them. One of the things that we can do, the, the, the thing that I believe is most important is to start working on yourself. You have to work on yourself first. Any change, any um, pro progression or um, anything that's going to help, help to change this dynamic mm -hmm. is going to start with personal work. Mm -hmm. What can I do to help me? to be a better person. And that takes being vulnerable. Um, it takes being truthful with yourself and really looking at those things that show up in your life. I started looking at patterns in my life and in my behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some things that I didn't like, you know, and there were days when I had to turn away, you know, I, I it was too much. I, I, you know how, um, like in this book, you know, there are certain things that you hit, you bump up against and it's like, okay, I got to close the book and come back. Right. Okay. So I had to do that in my own life, you know, um, get real about what's really happening with me. Is this the type of person that I want to be? Do I want to be the type of person who's, um, you know, who, who's angry, who's offended, who's um, upset, who doesn't trust herself? What are those things that are, are those things that are going on with me that are contributing to these outward behaviors? And you know that takes talking to yourself and getting truthful with yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that anything that we're going to do on a collective, it has to start with self first. And I think also, Keisha, you know, we'll say uh, she's my best friend. That's my you know that's my girl. Um, and we trust that person with so much, but then that same person can come back and give you construct. And, I, and I'm not saying you per se, but that mm -hmm. same person can come back and give women constructive criticism. Now, you know, you really should not have said that, or mm -hmm. I just don't think that color is a pro and we will, that same person, that's our best friend we will turn around and be offended. Don't call them anymore. Mm -hmm. That person might even say, you know what? Um, I think your business idea is good, but maybe you need to think about tweaking it and take this out or that out. And you, they become offended, but yet that's their best friend. I think we need to start right. looking at as women, how much do we really value relationships that we mm -hmm. say are pertinent to our lives? I think a lot of times we need to sit in a moment and say, am I really being honest with myself? Mm -hmm. Am I mm -hmm. really, really being honest to me? Um, am I truthful about my beliefs? Right. Because if if you're not, if you're not, it's going to show up somewhere. It is. It is. And you mentioned those, you know, having those relationships and not being able to drop down into a level of truth. That's because people are wounded. Women are wounded. I mean, we we deal with so many different things. We have the weight of the world on our shoulders. We're trying to be everything for everybody and not really attending to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And those are, we have to get to the core of those hurt, you know, tender places in us mm -hmm. in order to, uh, and heal those tender places so that we can um, not be offended and um, really have a best friend who is a real best friend and who can give you truth without those relationships being so high level and so shallow that you can't drop down into, you know, a real conversation about what's really going on. We also have to be okay with not being perfect. You're gonna right. make mistakes. I don't care if it's on your job. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's in your business. I don't care if it's in your family. I don't care if it's in your marriage, which you're gonna make mistakes. And right. you have to be okay with not being a perfect being. And I wasn't. I was well, not let me okay with that. that. Let, me, let me ask you this. You said I wasn't perfect. How did you feel when you recognize and realize I'm just not perfect? Right. But what I was saying, I, I wasn't okay with not being perfect. I, I later found out that I, I, I knew I wasn't perfect. 
Mm -hmm. But I later owned that I wasn't perfect and I was okay with that not being perfect. But I was so um, needing Mm -hmm. the approval of others Mm -hmm. to validate you know, my existence and that I was okay and that I, I did a good job and, and having that because I, I had, you know, those voids and those, those things going on with me. So um, I needed to be perfect so that I could get that pat on the head. I could get that, you know, that accolade. I could get that approval from other people. Um, but I, I had to do the work to be okay with my imperfection and know, listen, I'm gonna make, you're gonna make mistakes. You know, I I am going to make mistakes as long as I'm in this earth, as long as I'm evolving and I'm growing, I am going to make mistakes and that's okay. I was the poster child for, you know, things looking all perfect on the outside, but I was a mess on the inside, you know? And so um, my thing now is to make sure that um, I create a life that doesn't just look good on the outside Mm -hmm. but it also feels good to me Mm -hmm. on the inside Mm -hmm. and so um that's that that's my that's my thing that is what that's that's what I'm after Dr. G. You said something really really huge and I couldn't I was almost on the edge of my seat you said I needed approval one thing that um Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Perry talked about in the book is how soon our minds start to develop, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to think about um, and go back. It could have happened in your 20s. It could have happened in your teens. I want you to go back for a second and think about when is the earliest time you can remember that it might correlate to you needing approval. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I can remember early on, a little girl um, wanting that approval, wanting to, um, as I said, you know, we we sang when I was a little girl. Um, My family sang, my mom played the piano. Um, And so we were always on stage so to speak. We were always up front. We had somewhere to sing every weekend, right? And so, you know, they want those little four girls to come on up and sing, you know, give us an A and B selection. And oh, they clap, 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 clap. And we would practice and rehearse, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, My mom would give us our note and we would, you know, we were really good with that. We were good with that. And so um, getting that approval and that applause early on, was so ingrained in in me Mm -hmm. um that it just i just carried it on through i carried it right on through um you know the rest of my up until you know into adulthood for sure and i see that association i I see it so plain i'm used to getting a yay Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and here i am getting ready to go through a divorce nobody probably right. not going to do this. I'm not going to get right. all the accolades. I'm not going to get what I got with the cute little girl standing on stage. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is a totally different stage I'm standing on now. And yes, it ma'am. doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good and it doesn't look good. So right. what am I going to do with this now? Now I'm not going to get that approval that I'm used to. I was used to a certain thing. Mm-hmm. I've yes, it, ma'am. I, I graduated high school. Yay, Keisha. I graduated yes. college. Yay, Keisha, right? Mm-hmm. Even got married, got a yay, Keisha. And now here I am taking a totally different turn. And, you know, right. that can feel like a washout. One of the things that you said, a second thing that you said in your bio was that women don't have to settle for less. Right. Right. Talk to yes, me about settling. Because well. so often, I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Yes, ma'am. Um, after, after my divorce, um, some years later, I um, got married to another wonderful man, my husband. Yay, my husband. Um, <laughs> now, now the accolades and the approval, right? <laughs> yes, ma'am. And, and, and we're over 20 years in. Oh, wow. Um, Congratulations. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I can remember as we were dating, 
um, there were certain behaviors and certain things that were happening that because of my past experience and um, wanting to be accepted or have that approval, um, there were certain things that I experienced and things that I put up with in this new relationship that I probably shouldn't have been putting up with. I shouldn't have, but I did. <laughs> okay. And so um, I was, I was um, quiet when I needed to be vocal. And that was, to me, was a way of settling. Um, my, my husband said something early on in our relationship. He said that I, I made things so comfortable for him. I um, was a stress-free place for him. Mm -hmm. And to me, that equated approval, you know? So I'm going to do everything I need to do to make sure that I keep this a safe place and I keep this a tranquil spot, you know, uh, a woo space for him, regardless of how I felt about things, regardless of what my opinion was, I settled and stifled, you know, my true feeling about things and how I felt about certain things, uh, my opinions about things. They were washed with those words of, oh, it's just, you just make things so comfortable. Mm -hmm. You just make life so, you know, that that was stuck in my head and I stayed quiet longer than I needed to. I did not express myself in the way that I needed to. I didn't speak up like I needed to. Now, my husband's great. He's a great guy, you know, but there were just pieces and places in me where I settled and I, and I should have been more vocal when I wasn't. I, I didn't tell the truth about mm -hmm. how I felt about certain things and um, you know, just my opinion about things and, you know, my thoughts about it, my ideas, my um, um, hopes and dreams and, you know, how, about certain things. And, you know, so, so you don't have to settle, but you do have to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes telling the truth um, is hard. It's hard for you, the person who, uh, me, the person who was accustomed to approval and wanted approval of other people it was hard for me to tell the truth but then it got to the point where I couldn't not tell the truth anymore I couldn't lie anymore mm -hmm. to me I was miserable you know and so you know there started amping up that that journey of telling myself the truth and undoing some things um you know I I used to wear my hair a certain way you know, I used to be just very, very, you know, to the nines. I had a bad bob, Dr. G. My bob was swinging. Do you hear me? Did it, it have swinging? So it had body and all, right? <laughs> all that, all that. But as I started to uncover me and really, you know, get in touch with with me, um, the core of who I am, some of that other stuff I had to shed. It had to go because it was not representative of who I truly am and who I truly want to be mm -hmm. in this earth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not aligned with my assignment. It's not aligned with, um, you know, where I'm going um, and who's attached to me, whose lives I need to impact. It's just, it doesn't align. Mm -hmm. um, some of the belief systems that I had, I had to evaluate and reevaluate them because they no longer aligned with who I thought I needed to be. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um and you have to have support you got to have support I invest in good support yes I'm yes. not going to be without support right right you, you know, know that what, that is a uh Keisha one of the things when I'm counseling clients every day like I say majority of my clients are um women couples whether it's, you know, struggling in marriage or been through marriage or whatever. But one of the things that I tell all of my new clients when they come to me, I have them to write an exercise, do a summary of who they are. I tell them, mm -hmm. do not rush it, sit in it and ask themselves, when you say your name, Susie Beth, who am I? at the very core of their being, mm -hmm. who are they? Um, 
And that will include their value system. That will include their belief system, right? Nine times out of 10, when they come back, especially with the couples, it's something that they didn't recognize or the one spouse didn't recognize that of the other spouse. Right, right. right? And then when you don't know, you don't know. I also tell them that not only about the value system of themselves, what's the value system that's going to guide this marriage? There right. has got to right. be the value system, right? And so I, I, I realize that people don't do enough of turning that mirror on the inside. Mm -hmm. Beyond this skin right here, beyond this skin back mm -hmm. there, what's on the inside? Who, who is this? Because whatever that is, if you take that mask off, you don't know what's going to jump out of there. Exactly. You have to, it, you, you've got to look at it from the inside out. We get right. glamorous all day, you mm -hmm. know. We look for the pretty colors. We look for the, you know, the right jewelry. We, we look for all of these things, but you said it a few minutes ago, get the support. Are you having that support to deal with what's on the inside? It starts from the inside out, that broken Absolutely. spirit, that broken heart, that wounded mm -hmm. spirit, you know, that, that just misery laying layer after layer after layer. And you have mm -hmm. to get into a place where you can unpack. You can unpack all of these layers that you've been yes, carrying from all of these years. And what happened, people go into another marriage and you carry that same stuff. Yes, ma'am. Same stuff into a marriage, into somebody else's lives. And then you go and you have children and then you bring in that same stuff into your children's life. And it just Absolutely. keeps going and going until some point, at some point, someday you finally say, I got to do something with this. This has got to change. I've got to yes, change. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And that's exactly what happened to me. I, um, I did not um, do the proper healing that I needed to do before I came into my, my marriage, my second marriage. And it's things started to seep, you know, things just started to seep. Um, and I was miserable because like I said, I was, you know, stifling things down, settling for, you know, different things and um, just experiencing a lot of uh, just, just a lot of stuff <laughs> that I hadn't dealt with. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I, I had to get back to who is Keisha, mm -hmm. you know, and it, that was a hard question for me mm -hmm. to, to really, um, you know, to figure out who I was. I could tell you what I, who I wasn't. I could tell you who, who, what I didn't want. Mm -hmm. That list was easier for me than naming who I was, identifying who I was. Um, and there had to be some tough conversations. You know, my husband and I have had to have some really tough conversations and to have the support and to really process those things because, you know, it, it is a hard thing to be in a situation and in relationships that are quantity over quality. Mm -hmm. And that's what we decided. Mm -hmm. We want to have quality. Mm -hmm. what, what sense does it make to be tied to somebody or connected to somebody for you know a lot of years you got all this mileage and you know but there's no quality of years mm -hmm. and so that is what that is the work you mm -hmm. know whether you're in a marriage or you in just yourself mm -hmm. you you need to figure out what quality of life you want to have with the time that you have left mm -hmm. you know um, I read a statistic a um, few years back that said um, the decisions that we make from the ages of, I think it was 17 to 21, 23, somewhere in there, uh, affect, have the possibility of affecting the next seven years of your life, mm -hmm. you know, and I've taken that with me, even, you know, into, you know, my, my, my late 20s and my, my 30s and even into my 40s. The decisions that you make for any time, length of time, how long is it going to take you to undo that? 
-hmm. What kind of work are you going to have to do to undo that? Mm -hmm. So I really got intentional about what it was that I wanted, the type of life I wanted to live, the type of marriage I wanted to, to have, and the type of family we want to have, my husband and I want to have together. Those were tough conversations. Mm -hmm. Did they go good all the time? No, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. But they're doable. I tell anybody it's hard, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. You just got to get truthful with yourself. Tell yourself the truth. Mm -hmm. I have a coach that says, tell yourself the truth. And it's true. You, you got to tell yourself the truth. Doesn't and, matter how good, how bad, how ugly. You got to tell yourself the truth. And so going from, let's go back, going from when you <clears throat> went through your divorce to getting married again um, and still working on some things, uh, you made a conscious decision because I saw it in your bio that you um, help other women. And we're going to get into all that you can offer and do with women. Um, but you said you work with them and you teach them how to take back their lives and power. Yes, ma'am. And that's what you did for Keisha. Keisha yes, took back her life and her power. What would you suggest to other women in terms of how they can take their power and their life back. Because so often we fall weak, right? And we go down instead of up. We no longer say yes to ourselves. So what do you say to women in teaching them how to take their life back and power back? The first thing you have to do is to decide what you want. You've got to decide what you want. And that can be, you know, <laughs> it, it could run the gamut. That could be, you know, I, I want to, um, you know, ha have a, a, a weekend trip. You know, I want to be able to go to Walmart by myself. You know, it, it could be as simple or as complex as you need it to be, but you've got to decide what you want. And you've got to, to, to um, decide that you're willing to do whatever it takes to get what it is that you want. Um, yes, I took my power back. I've taken my life back. I've put some stakes in the ground as, you know, for certain things, but that did not come without challenge and it did not come without opposition. It did not come without wanting to give up. It did not come without feeling like, oh my God, what am I doing? I mean, but you've got to get truthful with yourself and decide what it is that you want. It doesn't matter how small it is. It does not matter how complex but you got to decide what it is that you want. Not what your mama want, not mm -hmm. what your children want, not what your husband want, not what the people in your community, the, the, uh, you know, the, the people groups that we're connected to, not what they want. You need to get to the, the center of the core of what you want and what it's gonna take for you to get there. So what I hear you saying is that as women, we cannot be afraid to take on challenges. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's sort of a different kind. It's, it's positive. I feel like it's positive challenges. Yes, ma'am. You know, we go through such horrific times. We go through challenges that's on the negative side, but you have to be ready to go through some positive challenges that's gonna do some things on the other side of what you're already going through, right? Yes, ma'am. Do you find women struggling to say yes? Yes, ma'am, we do, because we have so <laughs> many other things that are, that are beckoning for our attention, that demand our attention. We try to be all things for all people, and we can't. We are not superhuman. We hear it said all the time, you know, a superwoman, superman, whatever. We are not. We're not superhuman. We are not. We are human people, and we have to treat ourselves as such. We have to recognize that, you know, uh, some things are just not meant for us to carry. I have a saying, one of my girlfriends, she's probably on here, but I have a saying, you have to give people their stuff back. And I have, I have been giving people their stuff back, Dr. G. Mm -hmm. I've been worrying about things and carrying things and shouldering things that are not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we carry things for our children, 
for mm-hmm. our spouses mm-hmm. at work, our work responsibilities, our work family. You know, we commit to things. Uh, we overcommit to things, uh, push our things to the back burner, things that we need to get done, like getting to the doctor and seeing about ourselves. Self-care. You know, we're so care. We're so busy that we don't take time to do that. And it's don't. okay to take care of self. Right. And, and it's not selfish. Self-care is not selfish. It's self first. And you can't feel guilty because you do. Right. And I did. And, and you will, but you, you have to, you have to intentionally put yourself first, mm-hmm. you know, even if that's just having a five minute break, you know, if that's getting in your car and, you know, um, turning on your air conditioning for just a few minutes and, and having a, a cold Coke, <laughs> you know, in the privacy of your own car, right. you know, you've got to do whatever it is, whatever self-care looks like for you, you've got to start somewhere, but you've got to give people their stuff back and start, start to release some of those things that we feel like, oh, if I don't do this, this is not going to get done. I, oh, I've got to take care of that for little Johnny because, you know, he's not going to remember to pick that up or he's not going to remember to do his homework or, you know, I've got to make sure that she has this, you know, little Cindy has this for, you know, she's got practice after work. I got to make sure that her bag is packed and all of this kind of thing, you know, for the husband, I've got to make sure that this is done. Or for those of us who have church obligations, oh, if I don't get this done for that particular service or that event, then it's not going to get done. Well, who's going to do it? Somebody will do it. Right. Somebody will do it. One thing that I have witnessed is that (laughs) we can work ourselves into a frenzy. We can work ourselves to the bone. But people will step over you and keep right on rolling. Mm -hmm. You can kill yourself in a job in relationships and responsibilities or whatever you've got going on. Mm-hmm. But people will post your job before they post your obituary. Right. You've got to take care of you. You, you are your best investment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that we as women, because we carry things, because we shoulder a lot of responsibility, we, we easily let ourselves slide off of our plate in service of everybody else and everything else. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to know your limitations. Right. And it's okay to set boundaries, set boundaries, know your limitations. And that's okay. No harm done. Right. But in order that you can be able to do what you mm-hmm. can do for somebody, you have to set boundaries and limitations. Yeah. Keisha, this has been a pleasure. Um, I've really, really, really enjoyed talking to you. Why don't you tell everybody how you work with women and what you have going on? Why don't you share? Sure, sure. You can reach me. You can find me on social media. Um, I'm on Facebook, Keisha Robinson, uh, on Instagram, Ms. That's uh, M S. Keisha Robinson. Um, you can find me on Twitter as well, KF Robinson. Um, and then I also have a blog. It's Keishaology. Um, Keishaology.blog. You can find me there. I'm actually going to, I'm actually hosting um, a workshop um, oh, at wow. the end of the week. Is this the end of the week? It um, you can inbox me for more information on that. It's called Arise. I'm going to be, uh, it's a master class about self-confidence. So I'd love to have you in the room. It's going to be great. Um, It's a a 90 minute session. And so, yeah, inbox me for more information. I'd love to have you in the room. So this is where women can come and say yes. Mm -hmm. They can say yes to- Be a yes for you. To yes, get a ma'am. Kick start. We got we'll get a kickstart. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. We'll get a kickstart and, and help you on your road to choosing you to help you to, to teach you how to build self-confidence. Wow. That's awesome. Keisha, let's see who we got with us tonight. Um, of course, we have the visionary Tierra Destiny Reed. Hi, Tierra. Hey, Tierra. <laughs> uh, we've got my husband, as always, uh, peeking in. Michelle, hi Michelle. Hi Michelle. Um, 
She was just fantastic. Um, she was on last week. Just she fantastic. was amazing. Uh, amazing. Uh, amazing. Uh, amazing. Uh, amazing. <laughs> Tanisha Lander, get ready. Um, Pamela Adams. Hi, Pam. Hello, ladies. <laughs> Denitris is on with us. Thanks, guys, so much for joining us. Um, Keisha, I always like to have my funny question at the end. Okay. So it, it's always <laughs> one I just pull out the hat. So name one thing that is funny about you most people do not know. Ooh. See, you're so serious and, you know, you just so structured and you just so phenomenal in all of this growth. Uh, oh, the of what you're doing with women, but what's funny about you? What's funny about me is that I am a cut up. I love to have fun. Um, yes, ma'am. Even in, in my structure, I love to have fun, and I do. Um, I do impersonations. Um, that's a little known fact. <laughs> I would say give us one, but I'm not gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> one after one Give real one. quick <clears throat> one real quick Keisha Keisha <laughs> if I give you the initials can you tell me if that's the person yes ma'am initials TD yes ma'am <laughs> love you okay love you it sounds like Tia Destiny Reese <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The that's one and her. only. That's definitely her. That is her all day in the morning. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Wow, but yeah, funny. I love to have fun. I'm, I love funny. to have fun. I'm going to cut that's up. Funny. Um, but I really, really have enjoyed you tonight. Uh, it's just I have enjoyed so this too. Much that we can talk about women. We just want to see women get from now to the next right From now to the next and mm -hmm. whatever it takes to get there that's what we want to encourage them to do it in a healthy way and that's why when women heal community is so awesome and such a blessing to so many women because yes, it allows them to be healed, to grow, and to become empowered. And that's taking you from down here all the way to the tip top. You know? Right. And in Look partnership. Over and see where you've grown. See right. how far you've grown. And it's just amazing. It's just it is an amazing community. It is a, an amazing community to have the support and to have the sisterhood and have people who are on the journey, you know, it's great to have people who are on the journey where you are just ahead of you, you know, just a few steps behind, but to have that camaraderie and to have that support when women heal is a phenomenal community to yeah. be supported, to be uplifted. I just love everything about it. It's amazing. And I've so enjoyed my time with you tonight, Dr. G. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Now, next week, I want to everybody to share and get ready to come back with Miss Lander Stovall. I Ooh. am not going to give all the goods out. She's a When I tell you she has a laundry list of all she's done, all she's doing, um, I don't want to give it all out. I, I'm just not going to do it. All I'm going to so, say so good. is that she was employed with the United States Postal Service for 31 years. Wow. So looking at 31 years for that, um, she has two amazing books. Um, I'm only going to give one title, and that's Thank God I'm Saved. Now what? Um, it's just so much I can give about her, but I wow. don't want to give it all away. I need everybody to come back next week at 8 o'clock p.m. sharp for uh, When Women Heal. Um, based upon the book, what happened to you? So we're going to be able to hear from Lander what happened to her. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Keisha. Thank you, Dr. G. All right. Take care. Have a blessed week. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.